Hello, welcome to the show. This is your host Ganesh Kesari. Today we are with Moti Schneeberg, co-founder of FDNA, the leader in the early detection of rare genetic diseases using facial phenotyping. FDNA allows physicians to accelerate the clinical diagnosis of patients with rare disorders. Moti is joined by the company's chief medical officer, Dr. Karen Grip, who heads the division of medical genetics at Nemours Children's Hospital in Delaware. Welcome to the show, Moti and Dr. Karen. Hi, Ganesh. Thank you. So, firstly, question uh, to Moti: Can you talk a little bit about the phenotyping approach for our audience, and if you can also explain what made you pursue the phenotyping approach to detect rare diseases? Yeah, sure. Around 10 years ago, I've been part of a company called Face.com. I've been co-founder and chairman of this company. We sold this company to Facebook. And uh, in Face.com, I had amazing partner. And uh, we both said, okay, let's, let's try to do something which will create real impact. We start to meet many doctors in many different hospitals around the world. Mm-hmm. Up to the moment that we met the head of a big genetic center, and once we came to his own uh, genetic center, we look and he start to explain what they are doing. And then we realize about rare genetics disease. And we learned that it's extremely complicated to find the patient and to understand what is the disease. There are about 10,000 rare genetic disease. And I'm sure Karen can say so much more than I can. And each one of them is rare, but altogether we're talking about few percentage of the population. And the journey to find a patient, some can, t- can be about the disease, can be about a few years. And we realized that if we can answer this big problem, it could be something really meaningful. And uh, as more that Professor explained us, we learned that there are a lot to do related to the face, which is exactly where we are coming from. And what we realized very quickly is like, Ganesh, I'll ask you a question. If you're looking about on Down syndrome, mm-hmm. can you recognize it? Yes. Based on what I, I uh, know of Down syndrome, I think it's recognizable. Yes. Yeah. So why you can recognize it? Because it's not really rare. Because it's a one to 700 in the population. So we as a human, a case of someone with Down syndrome, we've been kids, we look, Someone told us from our own family, oh, this is Down syndrome. We ask our friend, we ask our family second time, third time. And step by step, what we actually did, we trained our memory, our brain, and our eyes. All together, we've been able to connect the dot and recognize. But once we're coming to rare disease, that it could be one to quarter million, one to half million, we can look and maybe see some abnormality. And uh, some top experts as a geneticist like uh, Dr. Karen here, you know, has ability to see it, but uh, a- any other pediatrician, no way in the world can connect the dot and be able to recognize. So what we said, and this is like our understanding of Lior and myself right away, that if we will be able to develop the largest database in the world of phenotype of where genetics disease we can train the computer, we can use the AI and to do exactly what we as a human doing in a Down syndrome to do the same on the AI for any type of rare disease. Yeah, that's pretty uh, powerful. And uh, the example you gave is good, uh, where with diseases aren't very common with those facial features, can you train algorithms to detect that? So question to Karen, when we use the genotyping approaches versus the the phenotyping approach which Moti just described. What are the differences? Are both very common? So when we talk about the genetic testing as a clinical geneticist, we talk about high-grade, high-quality testing that is different from what 23andMe does in terms of ancestry testing. So for us in clinical-grade diagnostics, We still talk about a large amount of data because our genetic material is very complex. If we know what genes we need to look at because we already have assessed the patient, we have a pretty good differential diagnosis, then it's much more straightforward to analyze the data that we can get from the genetic testing for those particular genes or areas of concern. Okay. 
both com- coming together uh, definitely i think it mm-hmm. probably will deliver some uh-huh. results and cat you mentioned about rare diseases uh, as moti mentioned that's a big challenge can you talk a little bit more in terms of from a clinical uh, practice perspective why that doesn't get enough attention and what's being done today about it yeah by definition rare diseases affect few families so if you look at one specific rare disease there might only be 100 families in the world affected by this disease so for that reason that disease is not likely to draw a lot of attention or interest or understanding or research money however when you put rare diseases together as a group you'll find that about 6% or so of the population are affected by rare diseases so putting them together they become very important okay and now when you're talking about say hundreds of families only having a, a particular rare disease that means very less number of pictures or data to train an algorithm so uh, moti how does your technology work and how is it able to get uh, and work with such small volumes of data and achieve accuracy yeah no it's uh, it's great you emphasize uh, one of the strengths uh, in the company and the uh, um actually once we're speaking about ai we all know that it's uh, all about data and uh, you know i listened to many interviews that you did about many type of uh, ai company and how ai doing such a big uh, revolution and uh, we know that what really matter in uh, any ai company is the data what we actually create in fdna it's about a work of 10 years mm-hmm. of collecting data from geneticists geneticists the top expert in the world from more than 150 country in many many thousand mm-hmm. hospital around the world that all of them together all the geneticists understood that in order to succeed and to help and to be able to recognize those rare disease and in order to take this kind of unique experience of those top expert in the world and to be able to bring it to everybody we need all together to join and for that we create the largest crowd sourcing in the world for mm-hmm. phenotype of rare disease and now as a result of that if we start many years ago with a 50 disease now we able to recognize 5000 disease and out of those 5000 disease 1500 we able to recognize based on the face other 3500 we able to recognize based on many different other phenotype now to your question about the small data it's true that it's the largest database in the world in terms of phenotype however our own technology and our own top expert develop kind of unique expertise to be able on a very small data to be able to recognize and we are running in a parallel like many different algorithm and some of the paper that uh, talking exactly about those algorithm that once you combine all together we have this ability to recognize typically with these technology tools even with earlier i was talking to some organizations on digital biomarkers so one of the challenges companies were facing was clinical adoption uh, by physicians so with a new technology like this do you foresee a resistance from physicians I think it's a tool that is incredibly helpful to us as clinicians working in the space. So while I'm sure there's resistance because there's always people who will resist change or don't like to use new technology overall, this is a very powerful helpful tool that is really just adding to what we have available in order to help the patients more effectively. So I would have to say most people would appreciate this technology helping us be more efficient making diagnoses okay yeah. today what is the uh, i'd like to uh, drop to the last point so i think right now in terms of geneticists we have in fdna about 70% of all the geneticists worldwide already using us now mm-hmm. the question about adoption to pediatrician so i think the fact that we are able to recognize 5000 uh, disease and not so much times that we'll be able to recognize all the rare genetics disease so if one company and its fdna able to bring one turnkey solution to pediatrician like one place that you can recognize all the rare genetic disease this is a good solution to have all our conversation with pediatricians the way to this moment and uh, we are feeling very comfortable about our ability that that's good to hear 
back to the technology computer vision while it can be accurate in several scenarios the, we'll have to watch out for the false positives or false negatives right what is the the error rate for your solution absolutely you're right that this is a tool it makes suggestions it does not by itself make a diagnosis so we use this as one additional tool in order to assess the patient it is nothing more but a tool it does not by itself provide a diagnosis agreed uh, any examples of uh, success stories which wouldn't have been possible uh, but for your technology yes this technology is very easy to use in clinic because we can have it on our handheld devices so i have used it in clinic on patients so i can remember one patient that has been very instructive to me where uh, after evaluating a young boy who was overall quite healthy, but had a number of physical differences and some mild growth issues, after using the phase two gene tool, suggesting a condition that's called smith lemley opitz syndrome, I had a discussion with a family and they were under the impression that indeed this condition had already been ruled out. But looking at the patient, looking at the strong match, in the phase two gene app, I was able to really reiterate this. And we went back, we tested the patient in a lot of detail for this condition, and we were able to confirm this diagnosis. Yeah. And to me, that was very impressive because he was doing quite well. He had a very mild presentation for this condition. So I'm really glad that we were able to tease this out. And on the other hand, now he's able to receive the appropriate metabolic substitution in his foods to be properly treated for this condition. So yep. Early diagnosis and the right treatment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you collaborating with other companies, Muthi, Ram? Right? Yeah. In terms of collaboration, like since uh, FDNA, our own solution, it's recommendation tool. So the next step, once we recommend, we want to connect the dots. So we doing referral to genetics lab and to bring our one solution together with the genetics lab result, as we spoke before, is the combination of the genotype and the phenotype, which mm -hmm. meaning and bring a better interpretation. And this is only through the patients that coming through us. So this is a number one. On the top of that, we all know about the huge revolution of the telemedicine. Okay, telemedicine, the number growing, and uh, now the COVID just make it even more and more and more. But how come in a any telemedicine session, do you think that the doctor can recognize the right disease? The answer is no way. However, once we adding our own technology of face to din to any telemedicine company, by sudden, they're able to see and recognize the right disease. And then we can make it available and helpful to many more. And this is exactly the mission that we have in mm -hmm. FDNA. We did last year, we helped to about 80,000 uh, patients in one year, our goal in the next uh, two years to meet the one million patient. The way to go for that, it's like uh, I mentioned before, going to the pediatrician and as well collaboration with uh, the telemedicine company. I think that's telemedicine seems to be a natural fit for your technology. Talking about the future, what are some exciting areas in research that you think in the next three to five years will manifest that you're most excited about? Yes, yeah, so for me, particularly the recent publication in Nature Genetics is right to the point because that describes in more detail a new jump in the technology where we can match very few other patients to the patient that we are concerned about. So to be able to make these matches with even fewer individuals training the system, that's incredibly powerful to me because it allows us to make matches and diagnoses in very few patients without having to train the system. So I can see how this is gonna become even more powerful in the very near future and how for us as clinical geneticists, it's really gonna move the field forward. Thanks, Karen. Very interesting. So this was a fascinating conversation. Thank you, Moti. Thank you, Karen. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you very much. <laughs>